Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. And then um, we had finished the week before the first chapter of the book of Colossians. Woo! After five weeks or something. So we'll get into chapter two. And... Um, Hallelujah. Let's go. If ye be risen with Christ, how many be risen with Christ? Seek those things. Glory to God. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry. I had finished chapter two, so we're in chapter three. I'm over here uh, kind of looking at some notes and stuff from chapter two. And that's not going to work if we're in chapter three, right? Is that right? Okay. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verses set your affections. Now, notice here the Bible does teach holiness. It teaches true holiness. It teaches holiness that comes from seeking a relationship or seeking the things of God. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of things purported out there, but just the truth of the matter is if you're risen with Christ, then seek the things which are above. You're to seek after the things that honor him. Your pursuit should be the things of God. And you can kind of get at least two grunts. All right? Um, so he says, if you be risen to Christ, seek those things which are above where? Where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. His position of supreme authority over all things, including the church. Hallelujah. Um, so... Christ, not some angel. Remember, one of the things that the Gnostics were doing were worshiping angelic beings, the fullness. So we were to seek after Christ. And uh, that's the focal point of our life, not angels. Hallelujah. Then verse 2, set your affections on things above and not on the earth. Now, those who look for ways to be able to get away with doing earthly things, you might make it to heaven, but you're not going to honor God. You're not going to bear fruit. Okay, we're, we're, we're called to set our affections on things above and not on the earth. Our heart pursuit should be heavenly things. Now, saying our heart pursuit should be heavenly things doesn't mean we don't deal with the natural. I mean, you know, um, husbands, uh, I'm not, honey, I don't have anything to do with you because you're earthly and I'm heavenly. That ain't going to work. Okay. No, we're to set our affections up there. In other words, we're to fix our thoughts. We're to set our mind. We're to pursue heavenly things. God doesn't make you do his will. You have to pursue his will. I'll say it again. God does not make you do his will. You pursue his will. There's a difference. There's a difference. You know, we're not robots that God makes us get saved or makes us get unsaved or not allow us to get saved. We're not robots that, you know, whatever we do in life, God had willed or preordained that would happen in our life. No, we are to pursue the will of God. Hallelujah. We're to pursue after the will of God. Amen. Our lifestyle is to judge everything by the new life that we're living in. In other words, is it producing life? Is it from the life of God? Um, <clears throat> when people hear something about we're under grace and not under the law and they want to run off and do whatever they want to do, you're not living out of the new life. Hello? You've turned the grace of God into licentiousness. No, you're not living out of the new, the new life calls you to pursue after the will of God, to set your affections on things above and not on the earth. God doesn't make you do it. You have to do it. You are, you are to set your affections on things above. Hallelujah. Then verse 3, for you are dead. Uh, now remember, um, we are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now understand, remember, dead doesn't mean to cease to exist. It means a separation. You're dead from the power or the authority of the old life. Now, it doesn't mean you can't walk in the old life. It means it has, doesn't have the authority to force it on you anymore. See, when you're a sinner, you sin. Why? Because that nature had authority to force you into that lifestyle. Okay? When you became alive unto God, you, that power was broken, and now you can not submit to the realm of darkness, the realm of sin. 
You have authority over it. But if you yield to it, it'll, have, it'll take control of you. Well, I don't, we'll go back and read Romans 6 and 8 particularly. Yield not your members as servants of unrighteousness. All right. Uh, verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should, I'm sorry, verse 4 of the other chapter. Uh, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. We're going to appear with him in glory. Isn't that good to know? Amen. The idea is a manifest time. He's coming back. Praise God. Verse 5. Now, look here. Stop. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. You're not going to get the glorified body until Jesus shows up. Okay? You got to contend with your fallen flesh. It is a mortal, corruptible body. You have to contend with it. You have to submit it and make it a living sacrifice. You have to take authority over it. You have to buffet it. You have to tell it no. You have to keep it under control. You cannot let the dictates and appetites of the flesh do what it wants to do. The works of the flesh are, Paul listened to me, but the fruit of the Spirit is. The works of the flesh will countermand the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, you live in the works of the flesh, it will keep you from producing the fruit of the Spirit. If you work and seek after God and produce the fruit of the Spirit, it will, it will keep the works of the flesh in check. Hallelujah. Doesn't happen automatically. Just things you do. Um, the believer must allow the life of God, the life of Christ to manifest through him, and that will produce true holiness. Now, I grew up in a denomination that even called itself Pentecostal holiness, well, Pentecostal holiness. We thought holiness was the beehive hairdo, the, the burlap sack, the, you know, um, you know the, the powder bank up on the women. The men, you know, they uh, it's just all, all you know, a, lot of, a lot of old t churches, you could wear a short sleeve, um, you know, a lot of things that we, we made outward. Like Brother Hagin used to say, some people are, are so, uh, talk about being holy, but they can sit in the living room and lick a spoon in the kitchen. Long of tongue. You know, they sit in the living room and gossip one minute talking about they're sanctified, testifying, they're saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold truth to the end. And then go home and got a tongue sitting there and they're sitting in the kitchen, living room, and they're licking spoons in the kitchen. They're talking about folk all over the place. Hallelujah. No, the true holiness is allowing the life of Christ to manifest in us. And how do we do that? We sit. He started out, set your affection on things above and not on the earth. All right? Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Let's stop here. And that's very, this is, uh, I like the way they say this. It's something I say all the time, but it may, they said it a little bit different. This verse gives another of the paradoxes or seeming contradictions in Paul's writings. He had just told the Colossians in verse 3 that they had died. But in verse 5, he tells them to mortify or put to death, the NIV says, their members upon the earth and, or whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Now, one minute he's telling you you're dead, next minute he's telling you to mortify. Why? Because we're functioning in two realms. We're functioning in the spirit and we're functioning in the flesh. And you got to do something about that flesh. You got to deal with that rascal. If you want to know what flesh is like, get a dog. Dogs are a representation of the flesh. They, they'll get in the garbage. You'll come in. You'll spank them. They'll, look, they'll be repentant. You walk out of the room, they'll go right back to it. Or you walk in, they'll just act like I hadn't done anything. You go around the corner and the kitchen is destroyed. You know, and they're just sitting there like, who, me? <laughs> it's like, like one time they had on Facebook, they had this video, and they had this big dog, and they came in, you know these trash can lids that, that, that do like this, that rock? He had gotten into the trash, and the lid had got stuck on his neck. <laughs> and they came in, and there, was two, there were two little dogs in the house also, and they're all just sitting there like, who, me? And he's got that big thing around his neck. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> I mean, you're guilty, pal. I mean, you're so guilty. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. All right. So, um, because Christ, uh, so we have, it's not a paradox. The truth of the matter is we're dealing with two realms. You've got to control your flesh, all right? Uh, it says, so mortify, therefore, or kill, the 20th century says, put to death, uh, Panin says, um, Wilson uh, says to slay. All right, we're to, we're to take control of our flesh. Can you say take control? All right, and um, what do you kill? What do you kill? Your members upon the earth. All, listen, 20th century says all your animal appetites. In other words, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And then he goes on and says this. Um, 
Because Paul didn't treat sin abstractly. He, he, he go and start, start listing stuff. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. All deal with sexual sins. Okay? Inordinate affection. Section that is not normal. All right? People say, the Bible doesn't say anything about homosexuality. And, and, you know, listen, let's run about Facebook. You know, there's six scriptures that deal with homosexuality in the Bible. And I'm like, you liar. Just lie. You don't, you know, you're dishonest, and you, just because it's on Facebook, you know? It's like that, that guy going on there, and, you know, and, and the girl's out there, the guy's talking to the girl, and she says, well, I'm, I'm waiting for my date. And, uh, and how do you get the date? Well, she got it on, on, on the internet. And he's a French model. And this slob comes walking up, walks up to her all lanky and slobbish looking, and goes, up and goes bonjour. Because it was on the internet, it has to be true. No. Just because somebody posts on Facebook, there are only six scriptures in the Bible that say anything about homosexuality. And, and then basically it says it has nothing to do with uh, it, not, it being a sin. And you're just, you're just dishonest. Whoever put it out there. Now, people who copy and paste it think it's accurate, but, you know, a lot of times. But they're just, the person who put it out was, was dishonest and a liar. Because they were just trying to rewrite scripture to make everybody have a certain opinion. Now, inordinate affection, you know, we, we know that's, that's not right, okay? And um, uncleanliness and fornication. Um, interesting, the word fornication comes from pornonia. <laughs> Pornography. I wonder where we got that word from. You know, and um, they, these had to do with sexual sins, okay? Um, and then he goes on and says, evil concupiscence and covetousness, and which also refer to um, idolatry. These are idolatry, okay? In other words, what's idolatry? Placing anything else before God. How do you know what's idolatry? Well, you're home getting ready to go play golf on Sundays instead of coming to church. Yes, golf. You know, um, I, there's nothing wrong with taking a vacation and going to something you're playing golf. But, you know, when you live your life and you, I, I see, I go by the, uh, our, our golf course here in Jamestown sometime. It, well, a lot to, well, Sunday mornings because we go to Winston every week. I got to go that way. And it will be raining. It will be misty, rain, chilly. And they'll be out there playing in the rain. And there are people who won't come to church on Sundays because it's raining. You know, that's idolatry. When you're putting something before God, you're in idolatry, okay? All right. Um, and then he says this, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now notice this. This, this list that Paul gave is not a full comprehensive list of all, of all sin. He's just making it, bringing it out of an abstract realm where people kind of, you know, get this idea that sin might be this or it might be that and have no foundation for what sin really is. He, Paul gives some hardcore examples, some actual examples of what sin is <clears throat> so that people understand it's coming out of your flesh. It's, it's yielding to your flesh, living, yielding to the appetites of the flesh in, in every way that you could do it. Okay? And then he says this, for which things sake, what? lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes the wrath, uh, for which the, uh, say, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In which time you also sometime, uh, you also walk sometime when you lived in them. But now, you also put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. I mean, cussing Christians, come on now, guys. The Bible tells you to put filthy communication out of your mouth. Amen? Lie not one to another. He says here, actually, the Greek says, lie, stop lying one to another. It's the nature. Listen, I, we, we've had people back in our church back in the past, and I'm, I'm talking about 10 years ago. Some of the lionest people you'll ever meet. You catch them, and they start, you know they're lying because they start stuttering and turn. I mean, all kinds of stuff. You'd see them somewhere and they were doing something they shouldn't be doing. You'd say, hey, and they start lying about what they were doing. Happened, it happened more than once. You know? Well, that spirit, it was in the church in the early days. I guess it can get in the church these days. What do y'all think? Stop lying one to another, seeing that, or, or because you've put off the old man with his deeds. In other words, as a new creation, 
There should be, there should be uh, characteristics about your lifestyle that are not left over from the old one, and that is stop lying. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, scythian, bond nor free, Christ is in all. All prejudice is, is ungodly. Okay? Um, it's, it shouldn't be among the people of God. Bigotry or prejudice. Greek or Jew is racial. Circumcision or uncircumcision is religious. Barbarian, skiving is cultural distinctions. Bond or free is social barriers. So Paul addresses every arena in which we can have a bias or a prejudice. And says, um, he says, put on the new man that's created after the image of him where there is neither. In other words, in this kingdom, there is, not, there is no distinctions. Amen? There is no distinctions in the kingdom of God. He says, put on therefore, or it says, but as Christ is all in all. In other words, we're to put off all the racial, religious, social, cultural barriers because Christ is in us and he's in all of us. Okay? So if you're a white, you're not a white Christian. If you're black, you're not a black Christian. You're a Christian. If you're rich, you're not a rich Christian. If you're poor, you're not a poor Christian. We're Christians. Amen? And in, and in Christianity, there's not an American Christian and an African Christian or an Indian Christian or an Asian Christian. We're Christians. We put off all those distinctions. Well, let me say something. I have been around the world, and I literally, I mean, you know, I've been as far as Bangkok. That's halfway around. Any further, either direction, you're coming back. I mean, honestly, it's exactly, almost exactly halfway. It's almost precisely halfway between, from Greensboro to Bangkok. So if you, if you go past it at all, you're on your way back. Okay? And um, I've been all over the world. And when you get to preaching the gospel and you get to talking about Jesus and you get, get into the realm of the Spirit, there's, nothing, there's not a bit of difference. Well, we know how to worship God, but no, 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 no. no. If, you're in, if you're in the Spirit, you're in the Spirit. It's the same Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. So uh, it's, it's just a pleasure to, to have been places and been around other Christians and, and you find out they love the Lord Jesus. Amen? When the Holy Ghost is in demonstration, it's the same Holy Ghost that's here in this country. All right? Hallelujah. Praise be to God forever. Somebody say praise be to God forever. All right. Put on, therefore, why? Because there is no distinction. Put in on, therefore, as elect of God, holy and beloved. Now, now, Paul begins to tell us things we're to put on. You know, we were, we were to um, put on bowels of mercy. It was, it, it's old English for deeply felt affection or sensitivity to the needs of people. We have to be sensitive to the needs of people. We just can't be harsh. Hello? Kindness is sweetness of disposition. Humbleness, a proper estimate to oneself. In other words, don't overestimate how great you are. Ministers. Now, you, you preachers out there, I understand that, you know, that there, was a, there, was a, there was a need to kind of swing the pendulum back from the old, you keep them humble, we'll keep them poor mindset for preachers. You know, you know the, the board ran everything, and if there was anything left over, the preacher got a little bit. I understand that. But now we've gone so far the other way, they're treated like gods. You preachers are the only ones that can fix that, and that is by remaining humble, not having an overestimation of your importance. Okay? Now, now I, I'm not going to say something. I know it's going to upset some folks. But why do you need for the church to give you a $60,000 car and your people are driving around on a Vespa? When we want to honor the pastor. I, I, I get it. It's fine to honor the pastor. It's fine to get, you know, you know, you could get him a car, but I'm just, sometimes we take it to the extreme that he becomes a God and then we are, we're getting the man worship. Don't you get a wrong estimation of who you are? Because without Jesus Christ, you ain't nothing. And without his anointing, you ain't nothing. And without his calling, you ain't nothing. I know it's double negatives all in there, but it works. 
We're Southern. We know how to make it work, all right? I know there's no cultural distinctions, but in the South, people listening to me know what I'm talking about. If you're out somewhere else in the world, without Jesus, you aren't anything. Without the anointing, you aren't anything. Without the calling, you aren't anything. That means ain't nothing. Okay? Hallelujah. I can say it correctly. All right. Um, humbleness of mind, you know, proper estimation of yourself. Meekness, the opposite of being harsh. Long suffering, learn to forbear with people. Put on is located first in this sentence. In the Greek, indicates position of most emphasis. We are to put on the new, the garments of the new life. As a believer, we are to put on the garments of the new life. Everybody say the garments of the new life. All right. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Forbearing, I'm sorry, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness, my, my, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Wow. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do ye also do ye. Now, we're going to have to forgive people sometimes that, that there's no repentance on their part or desire to be forgiven on their part. And if you wait for them to show up, you might be waiting a long time. I've had people call me up 10, 15 years later after an event and say, Pastor Ed, I have to ask you to forgive me. One person called me one time. They were, it had been, they'd been gone. They'd only went only in the church just a month or two after we first came here. And um, they did something. Got mad with me. I didn't know they were mad with me. But they got in a revival somewhere. And the Holy Ghost got to dealing with them about their attitude toward me 15 years later. They called me up on the phone and asked me to forgive them. Well, I said, first of all, I didn't know that I needed to forgive you, but I forgive you. I've never had anything against you. So, you know, you're free from that. Praise the Lord. Uh, about three years ago, somebody called me. Of over an event 20, 20 years old, something they had done. And they had, I did remember they, they, they had done something to cause some trouble. I almost split, well, did split the church up. But God got to dealing with them. Why did it take 20 years? Because they weren't listening for the other, 50, other 19. But you know what? We had to forgive. And I, I thought, Brother, I forgave you a long time ago. I, I haven't held that against you. But see, they needed to get it straight. Amen. But God dealt with them long time after the event. Well, thank God God can deal with people. But what do we do in the meantime? We go ahead and forgive. You might not live to see the day they ask for forgiveness. You might have to get there and find out that they, they, want, they, they ask God to forgive them. Because you were already in heaven or something. Or they couldn't find you, couldn't get up with you. No, we're to be uh, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. <clears throat> Can somebody say amen? Because we experience forgiveness, we should offer forgiveness. Uh, amen? We can't harbor anger against other Christians. Hello? You know, Brother Hagin tells that story about, you know, the, the, the church they took. They got there and they had to, they preached the Sunday left the next week, gone the whole following week for, um, for the annual convention of that particular uh, denominations district because you had to go at least once a year and get renewed your license. You had to show up for the meeting and, go, and, and get your license renewed or your ordination renewed. So they got there, preached one service, got in the car, drove to the next place the next week, gone the whole following week, got back home, preached on Sunday, and then on that Tuesday they were unpacking stuff because they, they hadn't even really got moved in. They just kind of got in the house long to preach and leave town. So they're unpacking stuff. This lady from the church comes walking up, knocks on the door, and in those days that's just how they did it. They showed up, you know, because the parsonage was usually right next to the church. Everybody knew it, and they felt like they had the free reign just to come and go as they pleased. That's just the way it was. So they knock on your door, you know, no privacy. They just knock on your door and expect you to let them in. Look, come on in. Talk to, start talking to her. And after a little while, she let the cat out of the bag. Well, I just wanted you to know what happened. You thought, my Lord. Been gone, got here, left town, something happened while I was gone. I had that happen one time. We were, when we were entering pastor in this church, we came in, we were, Jane and I were going on vacation, so we came in and preached on Sunday. The next day, we got up and went on up into the mountains to Cherokee and a camp for a week, came back through and, and then preached that following Sunday. When I walked in, there were people all lined up sitting on the platform and one of the church members on the worship team chewed them all out. 
I thought, dear Lord, what have I walked into? So I had to go pull him off and stop it. He was, well, anyway. You know, he, uh, he's the same person that we had. Some, some, they, he supposedly got somebody saved at work, brought them to church. They're bawling and crying. And now God, God's working on them. No, they didn't want to be saved. They didn't mean it when they prayed. He's over there trying to tell them they did mean it. I walked there and, in the and I thought I ticked them off. But I'm like, look, honey, if you didn't mean it, you're not saved. And that's okay. God loves you. And the door is always open for you when, when you are ready, or if you are ready, or if you come to that point you want to. But to live thinking, you know, trying to convince you that you are when you're not is wrong. So, you know, basically tell him to shut up. Trying to talk her into the fact she, I know you meant it. How do you know they meant it? They're telling you they didn't. They just said it to get you off their back. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Getting people to repeat a sinner's prayer if they don't mean it doesn't mean anything. They just mouth words if they don't believe it. So anyway, I, you know, in that, so he's thinking, my goodness, I left town one week, come back, and he got a whole kind of problem. And, he, and she says, now, he started, and then she started in on this woman in the church. What she did, how she did this, and how she did that. Oh, my. And... Um, he said, whoa, 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 sister, now when did this happen? She went, well, wait a second. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, seven would have been right back in the middle of the week while he was gone. So he thought she was going to say seven days ago. She said, uh, seven years ago, this coming Sunday or Saturday, whatever day it was. And uh, he said, I mean, just must have had a look on my face. Because she stopped and said, no, 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 don't take me wrong, Brother Hagin. I've forgiven her all right. But you know what? I never will forget what that old devil did to me. He said, sister, you're a bare-faced liar. Boy, I wish I was that bold. Anyway, maybe I need to get that bold. Getting older, I, get, I guess I get to the age I could probably get that bold. Loose, you still lose people over that kind of stuff. But apparently he got away with it. You're a bare-faced liar. Good old Texas colloquial expression, you know. Every Texas colloquial expression I've heard Texans quote, we say them in North Carolina, at least down east. And we were one of the first 13 colonies, so it must have originated here. That's for you Texans. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you Oklahomans, you Okies. We were one of the original 13. Hallelujah. So it couldn't have originated in Texas. Or Oklahoma. All right. So put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness, uh, of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do also you. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. To the which also ye are called to be into one body, and be ye thankful. Now, we're not going to be able to get around this. We're one body. We're not going to be able to get around this. We're one body. Now, you can pack up and go over to such and such church somewhere else. The second charismatic church, and the third charismatic church, or the second word of faith church, or the third word of faith church, or the fourth word of faith church at Greensboro, but you're still one body. You could pack up and go to the First Baptist Church, and you're still one body. Hello. So we're going to have to learn to deal with one another. And, you know, you can't go through life hoping you don't run into somebody you don't like. You're going to have to learn forbearance and forgiveness. Amen? And above all these things, put on agape, which is the bond of perfectness. I just kind of skipped over that, didn't I? Um, charity, agape in the Greek. The God, unconditional love. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which all, you also are one one body, be you thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And we'll pull that out and preach on being word of faith people. Let the word rule in you richly. There's a whole lot he said before he got to let the word rule. Amen. You're putting off, you're putting on. You're forgiving, forbearing. You're not doing this, you're not doing that. 
let the word of Christ dwell in you all written. I'm not saying we put the word last. I'm just saying sometimes we want to kind of jump down here and grab that one, pull it out, and forget all the other stuff. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So, Paul is, uh, you know, we're kind of in here in some, in some negative stuff. Everybody say negative stuff. Because we're talking about things not to do. But, you know, the Bible's not just a negative. It's got, it's got positive. But you can't just go positive only. A lot of people just want to say, well, you know, we don't, we don't talk about that negative stuff. Paul did. Hello? Well, we just, if, if we talk about sin, you know, we can make people feel guilty. Paul talked about it. I just follow after the teachings of the preacher of grace, Paul. Paul talked about it. Amen. Not only, not, not uh, solely, but he did talk about it. Okay? All these things that come out of the new life are held in place by the love of God. Remember, the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Amen? So he says, above all things, put on the love of God. Or gird yourself in love. Amen? Which is the bond of perfectness. Let the peace rule you. Then it goes in here. Um, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So now he's going to talk about um, let, the, let the, the wise teaching, the admonition, the counseling of the word dwell in you richly. Um, then he talks about using psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And uh, then, then he gets into this. Let your deeds be unto the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, do as unto the, do, do in the name of the Lord Jesus, give thanks to God and the Father by him. Then he comes up with some instructions. Wives, submit unto your own husbands as it is fit, uh, as it is fit in the Lord. There's a qualifier there. There are men who pull this scripture out and make their wife do things that are just not right. You have to submit to me. Now, if it's not fit in the Lord, you don't have to do it, women. Well, I'll just give you an example. One man was having, making his wife do threesomes with another woman because she had to submit to him sexually. That's not fit in the Lord. Women, you are not bound to do what your husband says if what he is leading or guiding you is not fit in the Lord. You're not bound to get drunk. Hello? You're not bound to sit around and watch pornography with him because that's, that's how he gets turned on. It's not fit in the Lord. You're not bound by that. Can I get grunts? You have to be, you know, we got to talk about things in a different way than we used to because of all the stuff that's out there on the internet and television and everything. We didn't have, didn't have to used to talk like this. Now you do. If it's not fit in the Lord, you're not obliged to abide under his authority in that matter. And shame on any man that does that. But listen to the next verse. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, wait a second. Man, if you really love your wife, you won't ask her or try to force her to do things that aren't fit in the Lord. You wouldn't. Children. I mean, there's not a whole lot, a whole lot more commentary you need to make on that. All right. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. But fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. These, these, are, these are things he's given us here. Servants, obey in all things, your masters according to the flesh. Not what I... Now listen. Now Paul is writing in a time that there was slavery. It wasn't black and white slavery. It was Jews under the, under the, under the rule of the, of the Roman Empire. And there were people who were slaves. God wants slaves free. But even in that, they're, even in, as a slave, they were to conduct themselves as a Christian. They couldn't say, well, because I'm a slave, it's not right. I don't have to do no, Paul said, you know, obey your masters. Not as men please the right with our service. But in singleness of heart, fearing God. Now, this would be a good testimony. And, what's, uh, and, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily. As unto the Lord and not unto men. In other words, you're going to serve what you serve the Lord in it. Okay? 
knowing that the Lord, you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord, G Lord Christ. He that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong and what he, he has done, and there is no respect to persons. Um, and then he gets in, we'll get into the next, chapter 4 next week. <clears throat> Masters, I'm going to go ahead, we got, we're, we're still early. Give unto, uh, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing you also have a master in heaven. In other words, we can't just totally break this system right now, but you know what? Treat them right. Treat them like believers. Treat them like brothers in the Lord. Do right. Amen? Why? Because you have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer. Watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying for us, he's, going to begin, he's beginning to kind of uh, wrap up his letter here. With all praying for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Now I'm going to tell you something, Christians. Some of us charismatic people have been the stupidest in dealing with the world. Now, a number of years ago, if you've been in Greensboro for any time, about 20, 25 years ago, they used to have this, this kid who would go up under his principal's office and get his Bible out and start screaming to the top, top of his lungs, Ye generation of vipers and snakes! Well, his daddy would do the same thing on the street corners. Well, the kid got called to the principal's office. You can't stand outside my window and do that. You know? Then they went out there and got on television shows and made a, made a fool of himself on the uh, Morton Downey Jr. show, late night TV show back then. Um, he had him on there and somebody else. No, we're to, be, we're to walk with wisdom towards them and the without. It may not be really bright to go tell them about um, somebody slithering on the floor and you cast the devil out of them. That's not wisdom. Okay? You redeem the time. Let your speech, let your speech always be seasoned with grace. Or be always with grace. Seasoned with salt that you may know how to, you ought to answer every man. In other words, be, your words have power. The way you, way you articulate things. You might say something in private conversation you would not want to say to somebody out there in the world. You rat dog, you're going to hell. <laughs> there you go. That's not, that's not grace seasoned with salt. All right? And we need, we need to let God give us how we answer people. In my state, will Tychicus, uh, Tychicus declare unto you, which is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant of the Lord, whom I sent for you to know the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Articus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. Marcus is son, Martha, Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. If he, shall, if he come unto you, receive him. Uh, and you remember Paul and Barnabas had a breakup. Okay? Paul's making sure they don't dis, disdain him because of the breakup. All right? Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, they're Jews. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been the comfort to me. Epiphus, who is one of you, salute, as servant of Christ, salute with you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that he may stand perfect and complete in the oil of God. For I bear him record. He had a great zeal for you. And to them that are Laodicea and them in Hyper, Hi, Hyopolis, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute, brethren, which are in Laodicea and Nymphos, the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, calls it to be read also in the church of Laodiceans. And you likewise read the epistle of Laodicea. And say to Artipus, take heed to the ministry which the Lord has received, which you've received of the Lord, you fulfill it. In other words, he had one last word. And, and to Artipus, tell him to make sure he, he, he fulfills his ministry. That salutation of my hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be to you, amen. All right, so he takes the last, you know, chapter four, particularly the last two-thirds of it, and just closing greetings and statements and so forth. <coughs> All right, praise the Lord. So we finish Colossians. Woo! We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, PO Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at 
www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.